Right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this talk, uh, Kubernetes Cloud Provider Project for IBM Cloud. My name is Sadev Zala. I am a senior software engineer and open source developer at IBM. I contribute to Kubernetes. Uh, I'm one of the maintainer for the HCD project, and I am uh, uh, one of the co-lead for the provider IBM Cloud project. I have a pleasure of having Richard Thais with me today. Uh, for recording of this talk. So uh, Richard, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yes, thank you. I'm Richard Tice. Work for IBM as a software engineer on the IBM Cloud Kubernetes service and Red Hat OpenShift on IBM Cloud uh, Managed Services as the release lead for delivering OpenShift and Kubernetes releases to our platform. And with uh, Sade, I'm uh, co-chair for the Cloud Provider Project for IBM Cloud. Thank you. Well, uh, th thank you, Richard. Um, all right, um, hello again. Uh, so for the agenda, uh, you know, we will provide uh, an overview of uh, SIG Cloud Provider and uh, this sub-project provider, IBM Cloud. Uh, you know, this is uh, part of the maintenance track, so we'll definitely give some introduction here of the project. Uh, we'll, we'll briefly cover activities and then we'll talk about cluster API provider. Uh, for IBM Cloud and the IBM Cloud Provider, which Richard will be, uh, uh, give a deep dive. All right, so um, you might already know about uh, Special Interest Group uh, Cloud Provider. Uh, it uh, owns Kubernetes Cloud Provider interface, uh, the code and related work, uh, you know, which is responsible for running all the Cloud Provider specific uh, control loops, right? So. You know, you know that when you run vanilla Kubernetes on different uh, cloud providers, right? They have their uh, uh, own requirements. They have their own uh, functionalities uh, uh, for for the Kubernetes, right? To run the Kubernetes on on their uh, side. So, for example, load balancer, right? That's one of the example there. Um, so uh, you can learn more about. Uh, the, uh, the the code there uh, and the GitHub repo uh, for the cloud provider. I have provided a link here. Uh, the seek also ensures that uh, the Kubernetes ecosystem evolves in a way that is neutral to all the cloud providers, right? So there is no favor you know, given to one cloud provider or other, that kind of things. Uh, it also ensures a consistent and high quality user experience uh, across different cloud providers. And the SIG also owns uh, the sub projects from various cloud providers. So for example, uh, the project we will be talking today, uh, the IBM uh, cloud provider, it's one of the sub project. And you know, some other examples are like uh, provider AWS, provider Azure. Uh, you can learn more about uh, all the sub projects in the link that I have provided uh, here. All right, so uh, the provider IBM Cloud, uh, as I said, it's a sub project of Cloud Provider, and you know you would be interested in the project, uh, especially if you're interested in building, deploying, maintaining, supporting, and uh, using Kubernetes on IBM Cloud platform. Right, uh, and the project also owns the cluster API code of IBM Cloud. Uh, we'll talk about it. Uh, and then I will own the code from IBM Cloud Provider uh, once we have that open sourced. Uh, as, you, as you can imagine, uh, you know, as part of this sub project, we have IBM uh, Cloud Teams developers, leader, you know, they're talking uh, through the open discussions uh, about uh, you know what's happening there, you know, sharing with the community, working with the community, uh, so that uh, you know uh, folks can follow the evolution of IBM Cloud platforms, uh, even you know, with respect to Kubernetes and other CNCF projects. So, one thing I would mention here is uh, the sub project is uh, you know it, it's for the open uh, source related discussions for Kubernetes and other projects, right? It's not uh, for any sort of commercial uh, kind of discussion. So we, we we totally discourage that kind of discussions. 
Um, a little bit about the structure. So we have three uh, different uh, leads for the project uh, from the different areas of IBM cloud side. We have Khalid Ahmed, who is a IBM distinguished engineer working on multi-cloud management. We have uh, Richard Theis, who is a speaker here as well uh, from the IBM cloud uh, Kubernetes service and Red Hat OpenShift. Uh, Kubernetes service, myself from the open source side, from the community side. Uh, I have given the link for the mailing list here. Uh, so please join the distribution list there. We'd love to have you uh, part of that. Uh, we have a provider, IBM Cloud uh, Slack channel on kubernetes.slack.com. Uh, we'd love to have you know discussions there, uh, questions, uh, any kind of you know other other thoughts. Uh, and then you can learn more about the sub project in the link provided here. Um, uh, the the sub project team, right? The the folks uh, who are uh, interested in the in the project contributions, the leads, right? We we meet every uh, last Wednesday of the month, so once a month, uh, unless there are you know things like holidays or, or no agenda kind of things. Uh, again, we would love to be part of these meetings, uh, provide your inputs, right? Uh, contribute to the betterment of uh, the sub project and you know, take a leadership role. Uh, if you, you know, miss meetings uh, and interested to see what's going on, uh, we have uh, you know, recorded all these meetings. We do record as we you know, have meetings and, and, and upload the videos on the uh, Kubernetes Slack channel. Uh, again, the link is provided here. You can take a look and you know watch the videos. Uh, we also participate in the general activities of uh, SIG Cloud Provider, right? Through their bi-weekly meetings, uh, uh, during face-to-face uh, -face conferences, we meet in person, uh, and then uh, brainstorming about uh, uh, the, the ongoing things, about strategy. Um, um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the, the, the IBM Cloud provider owns a couple of things here, the cluster API provider, IBM Cloud, uh, that's, excuse me, it's a GitHub repo uh, that I'll, I'll be sharing in the next slide. And then uh, the IBM Cloud provider, which Richard will talk, okay. All righty, um, so the, Cluster API Pro IBM Cloud, uh, uh, before I, I talk about it, uh, let me uh, briefly mention about the Cluster API project. Uh, as you might already know, it's a, it's a community project uh, from Kubernetes community. It was created sometime back with the goal of uh, managing the life cycle of Kubernetes cluster, right? So creating, scaling, um, and destroying, uh, cleaning up kind of things um, through, uh, declarative APIs, right? Which are basically Kubernetes style APIs. Um, you can read more about the cluster API project, a lot of good documentations. Uh, there's actually a whole book there. Um, so it's a good reading, you know, to learn about cluster API. Uh, as I said, you know, it's a, it's a similar style declarative APIs like Kubernetes, uh, you know, um, also, you know, the CLI. Uh, as you can see here, cluster CTL, similar to kubectl, uh, to work with the, with, with the management of cluster, it's there. So, you know, different cloud providers, they typically extend this, the cluster API project, uh, they extend it uh, to meet their own requirements, right, to provide the support for a specific cloud provider. So uh, from IBM Cloud side, uh, the cluster API provider, IBM Cloud, uh, the GitHub repo we have, uh, again, the link is provided here. Uh, we basically extend the cluster API project for IBM Cloud uh, for the different infrastructure of IBM Cloud. So we already have a, you know, a stable support for classic infrastructure, uh, what we call, uh, but uh, as you might know that, you know, uh, lately the VPC Gen 2 was announced. Uh, we have a power virtual system, a virtual server, right? So we have a work going on. Uh, there are a few PRs uh, out there for review. There are some issues out there. 
So we'd love uh, to have you take a look, you know, provide your review comments uh, towards the work, you know, that's, that's like in, in progress right now to support uh, different types of infrastructure, uh, you know, that involves some refactoring as well. So uh, as I said, we would like to have you uh, review those things and provide your feedback, contribute you know, as much as you can. Um, uh, with that, uh, let me have Richard to talk about IKS and, and then IBM Cloud Provider. So Richard, would you like to uh, take over from here, please? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. So yeah, we'll, um, we'll continue the conversation here into the Cloud, cloud Provider pro uh, project here. Um, I will set the stage a little bit talking about um, IKS and rocks first, um, and then uh, go into the details uh, under, under the covers there. So we'll start with IKS, which is IBM Cloud Kubernetes Service, which is the managed offering that we provide to create clusters, kube clusters on IBM Cloud. Okay, one of you know, many cloud providers out there that provide such a service. Um, so it's a starting point for where our cloud provider is used. Right, um, as you can imagine, um, IBM Cloud Provider running in this service. If you want more information on the service, feel free to check out the link I provided there. Uh, key thing here is it's a certified Kubernetes offering um, from the CNCF. So this is a really important piece for the Kubernetes ecosystem to provide certifications, whether it be a managed service or um, or a, a distribution, right? That it can that you can say with confidence if you're running your applications on this particular thing that it's certified Kubernetes to run the Kubernetes um, um, uh, APIs. So with that, we'll jump to the next slide and we'll go over uh, some of the release processes for IKS and how they relate to the community. So this year, 2021, we've released 1.20 release of Kubernetes. Um, last year, we had three releases in uh, the 2020 timeframe, uh, 17, 18, 19. And um, we've found from our users and uh, internal and external that maintaining currency um, with Kubernetes and the entire ecosystem of CNCF can be rather difficult um, because of the speed at which they move. So, you know, looking into the more details, um, we've seen not only us, but it's really a lot of industry-wide, a, a lot of folks seeing the similar thing. So it's not just unique to folks running Kube on IBM Cloud. It seems to be very pervasive. A lot of discussions on the topic. And there's a new CAP, SIG release, CAP to add release cadence for um, uh, Kubernetes. And this is a really, um, assuming it gets an improve, uh, approved and merged, this CAP would have some um, in, uh, key impacts to the project and to every... Uh, all those consuming the project downstream. So proposals to go to three rather than four releases of Kubernetes every year. Um, and believing that, you know, a lot of background um, investigation that's gone into it, uh, feedback surveys and such. Um, so that I think have a, a good direction for the community to, to pursue. Um, and um, so if you're interested in following that and how that's gonna play out, certainly a lot of the ecosystem will be impacted by the result of this. So, and I think for the better, I think for the better. Um, if, uh, in, in as far as patch releases are concerned, so this lays out the high level, the major minor release updates, which usually have been four a year, coming down to three, potentially. Um, they also could releases um, patch updates every month. And we've done the same for IKS. So very good cadence there on delivering patches. And for the most part, um, very good quality um, uh, coming out of Kubernetes community. All right, next slide, please. Um, Rocks, which is Red Hat OpenShift on IBM Cloud. We call it the Red Hat OpenShift Kubernetes service internally here. Um, it's another managed offering, this time allowing you to create OpenShift clusters on IBM Cloud. So we're all about, you know, in a cloud provider, being able to provide both Kube and OpenShift um, through our cloud provider, same cloud providers used for both. Um, if you want more information on OpenShift in the service here, check out the link. Again, certified Kubernetes. So under the covers, same stuff. All right, next slide, please. Um, just like IKS, Rocks has a very similar um, release cycle, okay? And it's, again, based on OpenShift, and OpenShift's based on Kubernetes. So you can see the cascade. This is one of many examples in the, in the Kubernetes uh, community with respect to applications running on top of Kubernetes and how a lot of them have a similar release pattern to 
underlying Kubernetes. So for rocks, we've had one release this year, uh, four, six open shift on top of 119 Kubernetes that is, and three releases last year. You can see them listed out dates and so on. Uh, again, both for Kubernetes users, but also OpenShift users, they see the same pattern of adoption and, and issues and concerns, um, which is um, can certainly be alleviated through vendors supporting things longer, but it makes it more difficult, especially when the underlying uh, support is not there from the community. So again, this cap will have impact, like I mentioned for Kube, but also for OpenShift going forward. And I suspect we might see some changes uh, potentially um, coming from these downstream providers as well. All right, next slide, please. All right, so how does this all tie together? So as uh, Sade said, we're, we're, we always love talking about community stuff, Kubernetes on IBM Cloud, right? And most people deploy it through the managed services, but certainly they could deploy it other ways as well. Um, and so supporting those in whether, however they wanna run it, um, usually an uh, important piece of that is the cloud provider and then the cloud controller manager in particular. So rewind a few years ago and how the community um, used to manage and work with cloud providers within the Kubernetes code base, they were actually statically linked into the binaries built for Kubernetes. And so they were very tightly coupled um, both in the control plane and in the worker uh, nodes. So now the new architecture, which the community has done a great job moving forward on, and, and getting really close to the end game here is to be running a cloud controller loop, a controller manager, if you will, um, in the control plane that handles the connection to the cloud. And that's that's the end game. We have gotten there, especially in 120, we've um, the community has completed a, a lot of the extraction and migration work. There's still more, a few more things to go, but um, a lot of uh, um, groundwork has been laid for that. So the architecture here in the diagram showed comes from the Kubernetes documentation um, detailing where the cloud controller manager usually sets uh, within a uh, cluster um, similar to the kube controller manager, but it is responsible for cloud loops um, and delivering those um, reconciliation loops within Kubernetes to deliver your, you know, load balancers and other main pieces of the of the cloud. Now, some cloud providers can run their um, cloud controller managers. They don't have to be in the control plane. They can actually run the data plane within the workers as well, like in a daemon set. That's also seen as well. All right, next slide, please. So if we dig under the covers a little further, look at the cloud controller or the cloud provider, the interfaces, what do that, uh, those specifically mean um, in the context of Kubernetes? So the first main interface is load balancers. Um, every cloud provider has you know, you know, some type of load balancer service they'll provide um, and then different implementations of that, different options for it, right? We're no different on IBM Cloud. Um, we have a set of options here for load balancers that you can run, um, whether it be on the classic infrastructure that we provide, which would be your network load balancers, version one and two, they run in cluster. And then if you're on the VPC infrastructure, you have a VPC layer seven load balancer, a VPC network load balancer, and we continue to work on providing, you know, enhancements, new, new feature function for load balancers. So that's a main interface. Then you've got another main interface here, the instances interface, which is also the nodes interface, if you will. Um, along with that is the zones interface. Um, so these, these are really important uh, pieces. Uh, needed to bring up your cluster, of course, you got the load balancers, and you've got the nodes on the infrastructure that you need to manage. Um, so the instances um, has two versions of the interface, instances v1 and v2. Um, v1, the v1 interface, if you will, is like um, the interface of the old architecture. It works on the new one, but they wanted to enhance it. So I believe in 119, they started working on a new v2 interface. I think it's beta now in 120. Um, so we're going to look at pulling in and using the new interface a little bit more efficient for the new architecture, for the cloud provider. So um, that's more of an implementation detail. But nonetheless, you can see the, the moves forward in the community on improving the uh, interaction with the cloud. So that's the nodes interface and then zones is similar. Um, but from our standpoint on IBM Cloud, we rely on node bootstrapping process to help set things up to implement this interface. Uh, another interface is the clusters. We don't implement that. And then lastly, we have routes. Um, again, not implemented for 
for our cloud provider because we rely on Calico to provide the routing necessary. But um, now these, these interfaces all being available have their own controller loops um, to go along with them. Uh, the nice thing with the new design from the community is that we're able to now turn on and off interfaces that are interesting to us um, for, or I shouldn't say interfaces, turn on and off the um, control loops that are of interest. So if we're not using a control loop, we can shut it off um, now in the new version 120 from Kubernetes. So we'll go to the next slide. And we'll look at some of the um, enhancements and activities that we've been working on for the cloud provider. So some of the big things here in 120, which is really awesome, is that the community has made great strides forward again on, on extracting uh, the uh, cloud specific code from Kubernetes. So the um, uh, cloud provider code, if you will, to make it more uh, um, cloud agnostic so that you can have some base controllers there that folks can leverage. And then we have a little uh, set of uh, build tests, examples to build cloud providers, a release process um, guide that helps cloud providers have some consistency across that, um, not necessarily a binding requirement, but at least a, a good um, um, process going forward. And so these have all been, been very beneficial, allowing us to, instead of what we always had to do is vendor or uh, have Kubernetes the core Kubernetes be a dependency of our cloud provider um, no longer has to be the case anymore. So we can build a cloud provider much smaller, less dependencies, less conflicts, if you will, that uh, uh, can go into the, all the, you know, the, the large set of vendoring uh, that Kubernetes has today. So that's a real benefit of 120 that we were able to take advantage of, a much cleaner build process, we were able to move to Go modules for dependency management, also a nice move forward. Um, and then we're looking towards the future here. Like I mentioned, we are looking at um, V2 interfaces, implementing that for instances, um, looking at open source for the cloud provider definitely makes things a lot easier as the community has made the extraction and migration uh, much smoother, um, improving our documentation. And I'll, as always, adding more feature function, of course, in the area of load balancers is one of the one of the big ones. All right. All right. Next slide, please. So that, that kind of takes us through the, um, the ecosystem of Kubernetes um, and how we leverage it on our, you know, in the IBM cloud space and a cloud provider and how it's used within that. And now let's, let's talk a little bit more about Kubernetes and OpenShift um, and how they're similar and different. Um, so, from our standpoint, running OpenShift on IBM Cloud is like running Kubernetes on IBM Cloud. A lot of similarities, they're both certified. Um, and and um, from Red Hat's perspective, it talks about their, their documentation. Red Hat OpenShift is a Kubernetes distribution. So um, it contains additional features beyond Kubernetes. Um, and this is not uncommon. There's many, many providers out there that have a distribution or managed service. You take Kubernetes open source, and you provide a little bit more value add to that. And so this is no different. Um, you have a few, um, few interfaces that you work with on Kubernetes and OpenShift that are very similar, but yet have a few differences. OC is the CLI for OpenShift and KubeControl is a CLI for Kubernetes, as you're well aware. Very similar. You can effectively run very similar commands and I, in fact, uh, just replace KubeControl with OC and usually the same command will work as right um, after that. There's UI for your OpenShift, console, administration, operations, and Kubernetes, the community provides a dashboard. You know, your, your distribution or your managed service may or may not provide it with you, but there is a community dashboard for Kubernetes that you can do a lot of similar things there. Tooling for image creation and deployment. One of the really nice things, and I think a lot of the ecosystem around Kubernetes takes advantage of is like, Kube's a real good building block, but it's not the end solution in the end for your business. So a lot of times people want to build on top of that. So it give you day two operations. So OpenShift has some of that as well, automated installs, updates, and so on. Catalog of, catalog of operators and applications provided by both Red Hat, but also the community at large. So a lot of benefits there. And then if you go back to the earlier conversation, you're talking about the releases and this release cadence of Kubernetes changing. That certainly has a broad range of impacts to OpenShift, but also all those operators, applications that are running on it, 
um, um, on top of it to make sure that they can stay current with those releases coming out. And the last thing I wanted to touch on is security. Now, obviously, Kubernetes and security um, uh, is huge, and a lot of a lot of effort has been put on that in the community to um, securing Kubernetes by default and addressing uh, potential weaknesses. And OpenShift's no different. A lot of focus is on that as well. Um, keeping um, your images clean of CVEs and so on. But one of the key differences that most folks may be not aware of off, off the bat is that um, pod security in particular is a little bit different on OpenShift than it is Kubernetes. And um, in particular, OpenShift provides security context constraints to help manage um, what pods uh, uh, can and can't run and what they can and can't do. In Kubernetes, you have pod security policies. They're very similar, but there, there's, a, there's a lot of significant differences in how they're used and, uh, or, and I'm just, yeah, how they're used and how, how um, they work um, and, and to achieve the end goal, which is basically the, that pod level security and security of the entire cluster the container level. So the thing with pod security policies being provided by Kubernetes is that there's now active conversation about actually um, um, de deprecating pod security policies and, and looking at what's the next thing to replace it. So an important conversation, I think, for the entire community ecosystem around Kubernetes is that, that security aspect. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing where that goes because it certainly will have a broad range of impacts to our, our community, um, both in the Kubernetes and OpenShift space and the applications running on top of that. So that'll be, I look forward to that in the coming years to talk about you know, this, if folks have interest in discussing these topics, these are a very good topic for our, for our, for our uh, project group. Uh, with that, we'll jump over to the next slide, which I think takes us to the end. And a thank you to all for attending and wrapping it up from here. So uh, back to you. Um, all right, hey, Richard, that was great. Thank you. Um, thanks everyone again. Uh, if you have any questions, please reach out to us. Uh, otherwise we'll, we'll see you during the uh, playing of this recording at the KubeCon, and you know we will take questions uh, at that time. Uh, uh, well, thanks again. Thank you. Bye.